Awesome. So uh, this is, I was going to say this is a weird audience. That's mean. This is not a weird audience. You all are lovely. Um, but it's a weird audience for me because probably about half of you have seen me speak like multiple times in the last year and the other half just don't think about soil viruses at all. Totally fine. Um, the other deal is that almost my entire lab is here. And so I don't want to scoop every single one of their posters. So we've got kind of a, anyway, I just decided to go silly. So, uh, and also like I have to explain the joke, right? Like hopefully some of you are familiar with this. If you're not, the idea is that there was this like really hokey, campy 1960s Batman, which I watched a bunch as a kid. Um, and like Batman and Robin, you know, had their little antics and Robin would always say like, holy, something ridiculous, Batman. And so this is all about holy spatiotemporal dynamics, Batman. Okay. So just by way of introduction, um, we're going to start with soil viral communities, what the heck they are and how we study them. Uh, then we'll kind of go in chronological order of a sort of chronological order of what our lab has been learning over the last five years. Um, forays into soil viral ecology. So sort of one of the first things that we learned over and over again is it's all about space. Um, and then as we started teasing apart, moving space around, um, we figured out that habitat is also important and time. And so finally, I think we're at the stage now at which we have a reasonable handle on these ecosystems and can start to at least slightly more intelligently design our experiments. Um, so I'll talk about some ongoing work of putting it all together in a spatiotemporally dynamic grassland. So yes, this needs an entire slide. Uh, soil is not, in fact, the ocean. Um, it's complex, heterogeneous, and dynamic over both space and time. Um, yeah. So <laughs> all of these organisms in soil have viruses. This is my artistic talent in PowerPoint. Uh, so we have you know, bacteria, fungi, nematodes, um, mites, and uh, yeah, they all, they all have viruses and we know very little about sort of who these viruses are or what they're doing in these ecosystems. Uh, what we do know if we trust the epifluorescence microscopy, which is the best information that we have, um, but it's imperfect, is that they're about 10 to the seventh to 10 to the 10th virus-like particles per gram of soil. And so my group is really interested in figuring out what these viruses are, who's where, when, why, and what are their ecological impacts. And I was really hoping that we were gonna have some really fun like conversions of stuff that make no sense um, in these slides. So here's uh, the beginning of it. Stay tuned for what might be some more. So um, what we're gonna focus on in this talk is how active are soil viral communities? Uh, so there are lots of different flavors of asking this question and you'll see probably a bunch more um, elsewhere at Vega. Right, so. Um, why am I not showing you a whole bunch of background information? There's not a ton published yet. Um, I think there's a lot of hype and stoke about soil viruses, right? So within the last few years, there have been a lot of review articles highlighting how little is known, uh, but we don't have a whole lot of data yet. And I think soil viruses are super hot right now. There's like lots of soil virus stuff going on at Vega. So definitely stay tuned um, for other aspects of soil viruses beyond what you're gonna see in this talk. But so our group has really focused on uh, the viromics approach. So sort of science fractionating um, our soil by adding a buffer, putting it through a 0.2 micron filter. There's a lot of tedious lab work that my lab will be happy to tell you about that I'm glossing over here. But ultimately, once you can get that soil slurry through a 0.2 micron filter, you're gonna have um, relatively purified viral particles that then contain the genomes. And so you can do shotgun metagenomic sequencing of the viral size fraction. So that's what I'm gonna call viromics today. Um, and before I show you bioinformatically what we do, I just wanna give a, a quick shout out to how awesome viromics is. Um, so here is just a set of samples from an agricultural field where we had paired viromes and total metagenomes. And uh, Christian mined the, um, the viral signal essentially from these two different data sets. And so the viral species, that could be recovered um, in the viromes, uh, about 3,000, give or take. Um, 94 that could be recovered in the metagenomes and the viromes, and then only three in the metagenomes alone. But actually, in this case, those three were from some samples where we didn't have a direct paired virome from the same sample. So we're pretty sure these viromes are capturing uh, not just the same diversity as what's in the metagenomes, but a whole heck of a lot more. All right. So. Um, 
here's what we do bioinformatically. And yeah, I can see as these slides are going on, there are gonna be some, some fun differences between um, you know, my computer and what you can see here. So enjoy that. Right. Oh, okay. Let's wait once at least. Cool, sure. This was the fun thing we discovered this morning. Uh, so let's see the same thing. And it's worse. Cool, <laughs> perfect. It's okay. I can do like a song, I can do like an interpretive dance to explain like anything that's missed. Don't worry about it. It'll, it'll okay, be great. we can try that and put it instead of the break. Let's try to sure. power through. Yeah, we'll, pow we'll power you. through. All right. Interpretive dance. So, um, what we do essentially is we take our purified viral particles, extract and sequence the DNA. This is um, predominantly Illumina in our lab at this point. So, then that requires metagenomic assembly to build those pieces into uh, longer contigs. Then we're going to use um, Vibrant or Virsorter or some sort of um, virus prediction software to recognize viral signatures on those contigs. We retain complete and partial viral genomes, 10 KB and larger. Um, and then we cluster those at sort of the whole data set level, right? So if we have a bunch of different samples and we've assembled our viral contigs, now we're going to cluster our whole data set at 95% average nucleotide identity into viral populations or VOTUs. And then in order to figure out the abundance of VOTUs in each sample, I think this is where the slide is gonna get super wonky. Maybe. Oh. Nope. And we're not advancing, let's see. Great, okay. So um, what I've in theory done is linearize these circular viral genomes. And what we're gonna try to do is map the sequencing reads to these VOTUs to get abundances. And uh, it definitely doesn't look like that, but it's cool, so you get, um, how much of the viral genome was covered in both the horizontal direction and the vertical direction to get a sense of the abundance of each VOTU in each sample. All right, so that's kind of an overview of the methods. And so focusing mostly on viromics, here we are. Um, this is our Batman themed talk. And the hint here is that it's all about space. So we're gonna look at what soil viral communities uh, are doing first in, oh, um, a cross-habitat comparison, or at least that's kind of what we thought we were doing. So we went out to a number of habitats in Northern California. Um, we have grasslands, shrublands, woodlands, and wetlands. And the idea was to see how different viral communities were among these different habitats with the kind of obvious hypothesis that habitat would be a driver of viral community composition. So with these 30 viromes, what we see I'll walk you through this. This is um, work by Devin Durham and Ellis Shiretsky um, that's uh, soon to be out in ISNI Communications. What we see is on the x-axis here, the occurrence in terms of the total number of samples in which a given VOTU was detected, and on the y-axis, the number of VOTUs that exhibited that detection pattern. So you can see that almost our entire data set was detected in a single sample out of this 30 virome sample set there's not a whole lot of comparison that you can do when the vast majority of your VOTUs were detected in a single sample. So what we need in theory is a more localized and spatially resolved study design. So we got that by accident um, in a grassland here in Northern California. So this is work led by Christian Santos Medellin from the lab. Um, he is here, definitely talk to him. And so um, I'm not gonna go over in excruciating detail the experimental design. Uh, but our collaborators, Jennifer Petridge and Mary Firestone and a number of others had set up this beautiful experiment to test um, how precipitation manipulation, so sort of drought, impacts microbial communities in soil. And the idea was we were gonna explore how, this, um, how these treatments impacted the viral communities. But you can see that Christian has uh, covered this overview of the field site based on the locations of the plots, not, it might not include the locations of the treatments, but what you're gonna see is viral communities structured by the locations of the plots. And so this is an ecologist's favorite kind of graph for visualization. It's called a principal coordinates analysis. I'm gonna walk you through it because you're gonna see a bazillion of these later in the talk. Um, so each point is a sample or a virome and the proximity of points is how similar the viral communities were between that pair of samples. So you can see that this is structured pretty clearly um, by first sort of like the, the blue samples are in the upper block the red samples are in the lower block. And then we also have kind of a gradient across the field. So 
highly spatially structured viral communities in this grassland despite the precipitation treatment. So I'm gonna show you um, these data in a slightly different format. It's exactly the same data set, um, but I wanna now compare what we're seeing in the viral communities to what we're seeing in the bacterial communities from 16S from the same samples. So we have viral communities now on the left and bacterial communities on the right. Each point in these plots is a pair of samples. And so on the x-axis is how far apart that pair, that pair of samples were sort of in the plot. So just like spatial distance. And on the y-axis is community similarity. So how similar that pair of viral communities or bacterial communities were. You can see um, a much more steeply dipping distance decay relationship in the viral communities than in the bacterial communities from 16S. And so this means that as you move farther apart in space, just across this 18-ish meter long field, your viral communities are turning over pretty rapidly. They're really different on two ends of the field. And there is a significant difference in the um, bacterial communities as well, but it's much less statistically significant. So the viruses are telling you something slightly different from what the bacterial hosts are telling you. Hopefully, we're not only studying space. Um, hopefully there's some impact of the environment as well. Uh, I'm not showing you the rest of this data set. In fact, even in this data set, there's a hint of environment, um, but I'm gonna highlight just a couple figures from some of the posters that'll be um, available for you to check out from our group. Great, so the environment actually is important too, thank goodness. So on the left, um, we have some work from Jess Sorensen in the group and she has been studying agricultural fields, particularly how different management practices are going to impact the viral communities there. And so, um, you know, I won't go into the details of the management, but we can imagine there's organic management and then there's the other stuff that people do that's not organic. And so when you compare those two management practices here in this PCOA plot, you can see a clear separation of viral communities by management. So that's an environmental impact directly or indirectly on those viruses. Then if we look at some of um, Sarah Gunsey's work, so Sarah has been working on fire impacted soils in a variety of different ways. She's also here, so check out her poster too. Um, we have two different habitats that you can see on the x-axis, shrublands and woodlands. And she was looking at a comparison of viral communities in soils that had burned in a wildfire in 2020 versus soils from the same habitats that hadn't burned. And you can see that the number of viruses that she's seeing in these two different um, burn conditions is significantly different. So if you set fire to your ecosystem, the soil viruses are also, you're, you're killing them, right? To some degree. All right, another poster. So um, now we're looking at the rhizosphere. So this is the root zone of these tomato plants. Um, and this looks like a complicated experimental design. I'll walk you through it, but actually really what we have is space, environment, and time. So um, in these tomato root zones, first Annalie collected samples from three different plots. Within each of those plots, there were two different treatments. So both of the treatments were in each plot, inoculation with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So basically adding fungi to the tomato roots versus not adding fungi, that's your environment. And then time, she took a look at these plants over the tomato growing season. Of course, there's like a difference in environment and the plant root exudates. There's like, you know, this doesn't separate perfectly cleanly space environment time, but it kind of does. So she got viromes from um, all 36 of these samples. And if you check out her poster, there's actually a good bit more nuance to this data set. It's not just rhizospheres, but I'm gonna show you the rhizosphere data. So now we can kind of rock, paper, scissors. Um, is it gonna be environment, space, or time that structures these viral communities? We're in the environment section of the talk. So hopefully it's environment, but let's find out. Oh no, all right, so spatial structuring has haunted us again. And I like Google image search, like what can I do for like a ghost of like, sp space ghost is a whole superhero. So um, yeah, we got space ghost. All right, so rhizosphere viromes differed most significantly by the plot from which Annalie sampled these plants. So here we have those plot locations in the field and we have another PCOA plot of viral community composition here. You can see pretty clearly that these viral communities differ most significantly by their location in the field. So this includes um, the two treatments, two different kinds of like whether it had fungi or not, and it also includes time in the plant growing season. So your plot is your biggest signal here. But we have a runner up 
The environment comes in second place. If you separate out uh, what you're seeing in each individual plot, you can see a difference by treatment. So in red, we have um, no AMF, so no fungi. In blue, we have fungi. And there's a significant separation in all three of the plots when you remove that layer of plot in the first place. So at the start of the talk, the silly you know, title of the talk is Holy Spatiotemporal Dynamics, Batman. So like, isn't it about time, like for, for time? Yeah, that's hilarious. Because okay. it's about time. Um, so now we have holy soil virus what if experiments, Batman, and I'm not going to go over this slide in epic detail, but the point of this is to say, I'm going to show you some what up experiments. We are not the first people to do this. This is like super hot right now in soil viral ecology. But the idea is that you take a dry soil that's known to be relatively inactive in terms of the microbial communities. You add water, you wet it up to um, kind of facilitate activity of the microbial communities and that also um, is driving some activity in the viral communities as well. So from my group, we have Grant Gogol, who did an awesome summer internship with Gary Trubel this summer. So check out Gary's talk um, and Grant's poster later this afternoon. A couple of, uh, we have a paper and a preprint. So lots of work in this area, but what I'm gonna show you is what's going to be in Christian's um, flash talk and poster this afternoon. Great, so this is um, a wet up experiment that Christian set up. What it is is, it's a 10-day experiment on soils from four different grasslands. So starting from, the, I think that's a, an important point, is this starts from four independent soils, okay? And it's just 10 days, so it's a short experiment. He has dry samples and wet samples collected periodically up until 10 days. And they weren't collected in these like open pots like this, that's a beautiful image, but where they were actually collected in these independent microcosms. So these are just 50 mil conical tubes with a filter in the lid and the cap area um, to minimize any potential for dispersal between the microcosms. And uh, Christian had the, the great idea to make sure this was really highly replicated. What we're seeing in the field is kind of a mess. Um, so we thought maybe we would need a lot of replication in order to see clear patterns um, in these soils. And so I'm not gonna show you um, every single individual soil. I'm gonna show you one example. All four of them have essentially the same trend. You can look at Christian's poster to see more, um, but the biggest separation is the four soils are different. Then within each soil, here's what you see. Another PicoA plot, uh, separation first by dry versus wet. So that's triangles versus circles. And then this is the crazy part, the lockstep sort of successional patterns across the six replicate independent microcosms at each time point so there's a clear sort of viral community successional pattern that is happening over this 10 day period. So within from 24 hours to 10 days after wet up, all of your replicates are doing essentially the same thing, which is pretty wild, frankly. Um, so go talk to Chris if you want more information about this experiment. There's a ton more nuance uh, than the one slide that I'm showing you here. But now we are moving finally into our putting it all together section of the talk. We've seen that there are these impacts of space, some impacts of time, some impacts of habitat. What if we go out into an ecosystem where we can measure all of those things sort of at the same time? We can measure time at the same time as others. Okay, anyway, um, that wasn't even deliberate. So, okay, this is our ecosystem, super dry. Um, for most of the year, the Mediterranean climate around this area, not in Berkeley, but pretty close. If you just go an hour out to Davis, um, super dry for about six months of the year, bone dry. And then you get this um, annual rain. And then that annual rain sometimes can come with flooding. So this is an ecosystem that has vernal pools that flood um, ephemerally for brief periods of time in most, but not all years. And so what this means, I'll show you in the next slide, a clearer picture of these two habitats. But this means that we have two habitats. We have mounds, and these are very gentle mounds. They're like yay high. Um, sorry, Zoom folks, it's like not very high. Um, okay, and then we have these valleys. These are the valleys that flood intermittently, but you can see through the rest of the year, they're pretty dry. So now looking at this from a drone's view, I made up this scale, it's just approximate. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, you, we have uh, four grassland mounds that were sampled and four adjacent valleys. So during the flowering time of year, um, our mounds you can see are in green and the valleys are in yellow. 
And so the first thing that Christian decided to do with this data set while we were twiddling our thumbs waiting for sequencing data, this was not the JGI, this was UC Davis. Um, waiting for UC Davis, our own institution, to give us the sequencing data, um, he was like, what the heck, why don't I just plot the viromic DNA yields, thinking that like nothing you know, would come of it. Um, so what I'm gonna show you on the next slide is a, oh, <laughs> you can't see what's on there. Oh, yes, you can. Okay, great, good. Um, I, I, to me, it looked like it was only gonna be this graph, which is kind of useless. So the top graph are those viromic DNA yields, and the bottom graph is soil moisture content. And we have, um, it's been about a year of, that these data were collected. And so you can see pretty clearly with those first annual rains, you see what looks like a bloom of viral particles in the form of increased viromic DNA yields, um, and then kind of a crash throughout the uh, plant senescence and seasonal dry down, and then very few viral particles, um, again, through this DNA yield proxy throughout the dry season and the subsequent rainy season, um, another boom, right? So it seems like viruses bloom with rain, at least in these ecosystems, and they decay, I use that term very loosely, um, but they disappear in some way uh, with seasonal dry down. All right, so that's, you know, those are the results of before we had DNA sequencing data. Um, we have some sequencing data, I'm gonna show you that, but I should tell you this is super preliminary. We don't have all the samples and we don't even have the full sequencing depth for the samples that we do have, but uh, the pattern so far is still pretty interestingly clean. So the first signal is that habitat wins, the environment wins. So remember we have four different mounds and four different valleys um, sampled over time. So the spatial component of where those all are and the temporal component, uh, those are swamped out by the signal of mound versus valley, these two different habitats. But if we zoom in, to each habitat individually. So um, into the mounds and valleys, we look at their own little individual peak OA plots. Here's what's happening in the mounds. So the mounds are separating most by space. This is not perfectly clean. You know, you'd love to see like mound one, two, three, four, all four corners of the graph. Um, but essentially there's a big difference, right? Especially you can see like in blue here and in green here, and then maybe these two have some similarity that we cannot explain at all. They're not like the closest together or anything, uh, but viral communities within the mounds for the most part were distinct by space. If we look at the valleys though, remember these are the things that um, flood maybe once a year, give or take. The signal is by time. This is for the first six months of data. Um, so what that means is that the four valleys that are spatially distributed are kind of exp like exhibiting lockstep successional patterns um, over space. So synchronous viral temporal succession over space in the valleys. And I think this is a pretty clear hint of dispersal limitation in the mounds that stay above um, where it floods and then mixing in the valleys where that flood periodically. All right, so that is sort of the end of the data portion of the talk. And now I want to uh, take the privilege to not give a summary slide, but to like wax philosophical, to just like kind of make up what I think is happening based on what we've seen so far. Um, in, not just in our work, but you know, in other studies in soil viral ecology that are coming out. So I think the emerging paradigm is that soil viral communities are highly diverse. I didn't even say that. This is like thousands of um, BOTUs per sample. Highly dynamic over both space and time. So over spatial distances of meters that we know of so far. We're trying to you know, zoom in to um, shorter distances and temporal dis distances of days at this point. So then we can do this sort of like rock, paper, scissors thing for like when is habitat versus space versus time important. And it seems like, first of all, like one of those is the overarching pattern in any given ecosystem. But once you peel off that primary layer, you can usually see the signal from um, the other things beneath it. So you just need a whole heck of a lot of sampling in some cases to, to tease everything apart. But when the habitats differ substantially, habitat wins. Under dispersal limitation, space wins. When there's mixing, time wins, and so on and so forth, rock, paper, scissors, sometimes one wins over the other, blah, blah, blah. All right, but the weird thing is that the observed spatiotemporal patterns, and I didn't show you the, this, hint for the time part, but it's there, I promise you, you can see it in Christian's poster. Um, the observed spatiotemporal patterns are dampened or not detected in bacterial communities that are measured from total DNA. So what the heck does that mean? That means either like your viruses are fundamentally ecologically behaving differently from their hosts, 
which is crazy, but maybe possible if you try to wrap your brain around that. Or maybe there's like just a fundamental difference in the methodology and what these two approaches are able to tell you about your ecosystem. Um, I think maybe it's a little bit of both, but definitely the latter. So I think viromes, because viral particles are really ephemeral, they don't stick around for very long. I think they're capturing really recent activity. So the active slow microbiome. So I wanna thank a whole bunch of people. Um, so this is the lab, everybody in blue is here. Um, so Jane is not here because she's like, she has a qualifying exam coming up, but she's fantastic. Uh, so I'm sure she'll be at the next one. Um, this is all of us in the elevator after practicing posters uh, the other day. And um, I also really wanna highlight Mary Firestone and other collaborators at UC Berkeley, as well as Jennifer Petridge at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. They were instrumental in setting up that precipitation manipulation experiment. Um, and then the DOE funded most of the sort of natural ecosystem work and the USDA, the agricultural parts. And if there's time for questions, I'd be very happy to take questions. We do have time and we have reactions on, on Zoom with all the claps coming up, but <laughs> come on, don't be shy. Also, you can ask questions from Zoom. We will read them. Uh, that was very nice. The, the question I have is how sure are you that the viruses are ephemeral. I guess I didn't understand that versus a portion of them being ephemeral and others being very stable and long lasting. Totally, I think that's a great question. Okay, so how confident are we that the viruses are ephemeral? Uh, ephemeral? I think the closest data that we have is going to be um, this right here. So, I th and I think we can talk about ephemeral at the level of a viral population and ephemeral at the level of a viral particle. Um, I think the populations, if I had to speculate, the populations stick around. But I think that at this time of the year, most of those populations are inside host cells in some capacity. But the question is, um, if, they're, if they're sticking around throughout that dry season, is just like one or two infectious viral particles that remain, is that enough to drive this pattern later? I don't know. Um, but what I will say about sort of the ephemeral nature of this is actually highlighted more in this part of the graph which is where we had um, what Christian has been calling the false start, where we had an initial rain event and then we didn't have another one for a while. And so soil moisture dips and the viral communities dip over just like a week or two. And so that's really consistent with lab results. I think these viral particles do not stick around long for the most part. Yeah. Hi, very cool talk. Um, I was really interested in the kind of like striking result that most of the virome is not contained within the total metagenome. And I just wanted to like ask you for your thoughts on how you think that that scales with habitat complexity. Like if you look at your like least complex samples, do you see more overlap? And also like how that um, scales with sequencing depth of metagenome, like if you sequence 10 times more, would you see these start to converge, et cetera? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, so I, I suspect that it's um, precisely the complexity of your data set and also um, your sequencing depth. So if you could imagine that you could sequence deeply enough and assemble everything or at least sequence everything, right? Because we're including read mapping back to VO2s from the viromes in those populations. Um, I suspect hypothetically you could get just about everything that way. There's another um, wrench to throw in the mix, which is also, this gets in the weeds a little bit, um, but it's also the breadth that you're requiring across a contig for detection. So you could imagine that if you're not sampling, you know, you have a low abundance virus that you're not sampling very well in your metagenome, it might only map to one region. But if you're being really stringent about requiring full recovery, you might not see it. So I think, so we're starting to see um, in our lab and in, in collaborations where if you play with that threshold, you can see the virus, but I wanna be careful about driving the field in that direction because we can do that when we have a paired virome to know for sure that you know, this thing is actually there in the metagenome, whereas if you start detecting a VO2 based on a single read out of a metagenome, that might not be the case. So yeah, cool. thank you. Okay, somewhat similarly, like the result um, where the virome seemed to change over space, over the 18 meters uh, across the sam sampling sites, while the, um, the host distribution didn't really change as much. How, you know, how certain is that as a, you know, do you, do you actually think that there are different like viral communities as, as you move across space or could it really just be, you know, well, we need to sample more deeply or maybe it's, you know, more, 
you're cap capturing the active virome as opposed to like the entire thing. Yeah, I, th I think those um, for the virome, I think those are real. Um, I think that's a real pattern. I think for the microbial community, the jury is still out on whether that's a real pattern versus um, like methodological bias. I bet you if I had to put money on this, if we do say metatranscriptomics or we capture the bacterial community at the same integrated temporal scale as the viral community, we'll actually see um, the same pattern. And there have been some hints of that um, looking at strain variation in bacterial communities over space that show that pattern. So I think that's what's going on. One last important question here, and then a Zoom one, and then wrap up. Just a, a short question. Um, have you looked at your viral genomes for integrases that might inform this latency question? Yeah, so not as much as, as we should at this point. I'm going to quote um, Alexa Nicholas's very recent work that just came out as a bioarchive preprint where they did exactly that, and they do not find evidence for um, integrases and basically for lysogeny to be the explanation. Um, I'm gonna wax virusophical myself here and say that I personally think it's pseudo lysogeny. So that means an arrested infection that can be either an arrested lytic infection or an arrested you know, lysogenic infection. It's essentially just the genome hanging out in a host cell. It's really common under nutrient limiting conditions in um, culture. And so that essentially gives you the, avail the ability to have this situation, but where the lytic viruses are also inside the host cells, not just the temperate ones. Yeah. Okay, and last question, and there are actually more questions on Zoom, so I will have you, you know, type the answer later. But we'll take the first one because I, uh, first it was, you know, here in time, and I love it. Um, so you showed the, exactly this plot, you know, DNA yield of virome versus like soil moisture, but, um, and I'm, I will summarize the question, but basically what about extracellular DNA and, and just like eDNA, uh, extra, yeah. Just micro, like microbial free DNA, basically. I love that question. Okay, so what about the eDNA? I'm going to plug Gary's talk and Grant Gogol's poster, which is focused on uh, specifically the environmental DNA. Also, Christian's poster has a good bit of information about environmental DNA. Um, so there's a lot more that I could say about that than I will in a very brief period of time. Um, but essentially, uh, these are DNA-treated viromes. So hopefully the eDNA is not really there. That's the real signal. But if you look, we have some virums that are not DNA treated. If you look at those, you see that the DNA kind of gets eaten. So it's like high here and then it decreases. So basically the extracellular DNA pattern looks like it's high in dry soils and disappears um, with the rainy season. And so I guess if the question is like, how is eDNA impacting these results? I'd say it's impacting them um, a lot in the viromes that aren't DNA treated um, and less in the viromes that are. But what also comes through in these DNA treated viromes are small cells and maybe like shrunken cells and spores and things like that. So talk to Christian about that if you have questions. Perfect. Thank you.